Yes, you My lady, the first witness today is Dr Quentin Sandifer. I'm sorry that you, I think, came yesterday and then we had to ask you to go away. I'm sorry to make you about. I'm very grateful, my lady, that you've allowed me to start this morning <laughs> rather than late yesterday. <laughs> I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth thank you take a seat good morning dr sandifer thank you very much for coming again to assist the inquiry uh, could you start by giving us your full name please quentin sandifer Thank you. And is it right that you have provided a witness statement to assist this module, which is at INQ 30267867, dated the 4th of September 2023? That is correct. Uh, you also provided a corporate witness statement in module 1 at INQ uh, 30192266. Is that right? That is correct. You also gave evidence in module 1? Yes. Thank you. And are uh, both of those statements true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Could I start, please, by asking you um, about your qualifications? Is it right that you qualified as a medical doctor in 1985 and that you've been a fully registered medical practitioner since 1986? That is correct. Uh, you're also a registered specialist in public health medicine and have a <coughs> master's degree in public health from the University of Wales, Cardiff. Yes. You hold a certificate in leadership in multi-agency emergency response and recovery command and coordination following completion of an exercise gold in March 2015. That's right. Um, you also hold other degrees, awards and fellowships that I, I won't go into. Um, is it right that as far as your past career is concerned, um, that you trained in general practice in the UK... You worked in Canada as a family practitioner between 1990 and 1992. You then returned to the UK and undertook public health training in Cardiff. Yes. Between 1997 and 2004, you worked for a health authority local health board in Swansea, first as a consultant in public health medicine and then as a director of public health. That's right. Between 2004 and 2012, you worked for strategic health authorities primary care trusts and local authorities in South East London, sorry, South East England and London in public health leadership roles. That's right. You then returned to Wales in October 2012 to take up the post of <coughs> Executive Director of Public Health Services and Medical Director at Public Health Wales. That's right. And you were in that role from October 2012 until the 27th of November 2020, which is when you retired. That's right. <clears throat> um, during the pandemic, were you also the lead strategic director in Public Health Wales? I was, yes. And it's right that after you retired <coughs> in November 2020, you didn't have any more involvement in the response? That is right. <coughs> For completeness, is it right that following your retirement, um, that you were reapproached by Public Health Wales and that since January 2021 you've been working as a part-time <laughs> consultant as um, with the title consultant advisor on pandemic and international health. That's correct and you will see in my statement that I've explained what each of those roles involved. Thank you Dr Sandifer. Um, I would like to this morning um, deal mainly with the initial few months of the, the pandemic, going into the detail of, of what was happening um, in, in that crucial period. Um, before I do, there's just a couple of short matters I'd like to ask you some questions on. Um, you say in your statement that you attended very few decision-making committees, groups or forums dealing with or impacting upon the Welsh Government's response to COVID-19. You also say that you attended very few ministerial meetings during the pandemic. That's um, correct. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So the question is, bearing in mind your role as lead strategic director, leading an unprecedented response to this pandemic, do you think you should have been more involved 
in decision-making forums and have attended more ministerial meetings? I, I don't. I think the um, important point to remember is that I had direct communication uh, and very regular communication throughout the pandemic response with the chief medical officer. Uh, and uh, where relevant, um, I was brought into discussions, for example, uh, in uh, May about the setting up of the Test, Trace, Protect program, which might have been attended by ministers, or, for example, uh, the, the uh, meetings that took place in September and early October about local restrictions. Um, Public Health Wales is separate from the Welsh Government. It's not a part of government. It's not an executive agency of the Welsh Government. So it is entirely appropriate that I should uh, provide uh, my advice through someone like the Chief Medical Officer rather than directly to the Minister, unless the Minister expressly asked me to do so. But in a pandemic such as this, do you see any benefit in either yourself or the Chief Executive of Public Wealth, Health Wales having a direct line to ministers, sitting around the table with them, answering questions as and when they arise? Well, the, the Chief Executive, or, or as she explained yesterday, does have a direct line of communication to ministers, uh, usually in the company of the, uh, uh, the chair. Um, so... Um, but to answer your question, I don't think that's absolutely necessary. I, I, I make the point that uh, my responsibility, uh, as I saw it, was to give um, strategic leadership, professional strategic leadership within Public Health Wales uh, to the response uh, and to communicate my advice uh, accordingly to Welsh Government and the appropriate uh, forum for doing that was through the Chief Medical Officer. Thank you. We heard through Dr Cooper yesterday that a lot of the communications with the Chief Medical Officer were in the form of informal quick catch-ups, I think she said about half an hour, and that those were not always recorded. Do you think that there should have been a more formalised structure for your meetings with the Chief Medical Officer for Wales? Well... Uh, as you um, are seeking to understand exactly what was happening in those um, early weeks, allow me to just um, share some context. So uh, the meetings that Dr Cooper referred to that you've just referenced um, were purposely uh, intended to be informal quick catch-ups and they were established from Monday the 27th of January, held two or three times a week and it was essentially an exchange of information. Where were we? What were we going to do? Uh, uh, next, and how could we, uh, Chief Medical Officer, assist you? Um, but I was in direct communication with the Chief Medical Officer right from the very uh, beginning. Now, to come to your particular point about uh, recording of those, well, of course, um, it would always be preferable, uh, if we could, uh, to record the discussions that were taking place. But by the end of January... I was in my office at 7 o'clock in the morning and with most of my team rarely left before about 9 or 10 o'clock at night. It was absolutely frantic. And I barely had a moment to stop and take breath. Uh, I simply didn't have uh, the time myself to record. And to be honest, there was so much going on, I didn't think that uh, it was the most appropriate use of people's time for me to uh, redirect staff that we were already mobilising for other activities uh, in order to simply take notes. That's not to diminish their importance, but to try and communicate across to this inquiry the extent of the work and the activities we were undertaking. Um in relation to that, um, whilst it's understandable that you were seeking to deploy resources as best you could, is it right that the um, Public Health Wales Emergency Response Plan did envisage that there would be a logger who would make uh, a record of all, all key decisions and, and discussions? That is true, and we applied that logist, that's the correct title, uh, to our silver group, uh, and indeed to our incident management team that we established from the 23rd 
And those were the meetings that I felt were um, the ones that we really needed to record. Thank you. Can I ask you about the Health Protection Advisory Group, please? Um, this was another vehicle um, through which you had contact with the Welsh Government that we didn't cover with Dr Cooper yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, is it right that this group was a non-statutory committee that was established and chaired by the Chief Medical Officer for Wales? It was, yes. And um, is it also right that that group went into abeyance and then was re-established during the pandemic? Yes, and I clarified the reasons for that in my Module 1 testimony. Um, but for the record, uh, we had a change of CMO in um, 2016. Uh, the then uh, CMO uh, retired, and uh, Dr Frank Atherton was uh, appointed in the August. Uh, the um, HPAG, the Health Protection Advisory Group, which the CMO had established many years earlier, uh, simply was suspended. And then when Dr Atherton had, um, I think, uh, fully established himself in his role, he recognised the need for it and re-established it in 2018, as we describe uh, in my statement. Is it right that... Um members of HPAG prior to the pandemic included officials from the Welsh Government, health boards, local authority, Public Health Wales, um, the Health and Safety Executive and other bodies? Yes. When it reconvened during the pandemic, the m membership expanded, didn't it? It did. It's worth perhaps noting that it was reconvened on the 7th of July 2020. That's right. And, and do you think that... Um, bearing in mind what was happening prior to that date, that it should have been reconvened earlier? Um, I'll be honest with you, I was surprised that it wasn't reconvened earlier. We held a meeting on the 17th of December, um, 2019 that is, and uh, I would have normally expected it to have um, met again in about three months' time. Uh, but I don't know why it wasn't reconvened, but that was um, a surprise to me. Um, we heard yesterday about lots of different groups that Public Health Wales and, and the government were involved with. What did HPAG add to the other structures? Uh, what it added, uh, what it could have added, is it would have brought together a wide range of our uh, statutory partners uh, with a common interest in public health protection not just the emergency response, but public health protection broadly uh, around the table uh, for a discussion. Um, the fact that it didn't meet until the 7th of January, um, I don't think in any way impeded our response uh, through those first six months. 7th of July? Sorry, 7th of July, my lady. I apologise. And so prior to that date then, was there a different forum in which all of those statutory partners could come together in, in, in a similar way? Yes. Uh, so again, I explain this in my statement. Um, we uh, convened the Public Health Wales Public Health uh, Strategic Coordinating Support Group. I know it's a rather clunky title, yes. but <laughs> it was what I agreed back in 2014 during Ebola. Uh, represented the best characterization of its intent. Um, now, the purpose of that group was uh, effectively to enable us uh, to bring together all these strat um, strategic partners involved in um, an emergency response who would otherwise uh, be convening in separate strategic coordination, coordinating groups, bring them all together in one room, and then we could discharge the responsibilities and the requests of us in one place rather than in four places. The practicalities for a small public health team of servicing four strategic coordinating groups in the midst of an emergency of the scale that we were dealing with just meant that it was untenable by even the middle of March for us, uh, by which time all four SCGs were in place to have supported them properly uh, as individual uh, organisations. 
the Welsh Government were entirely happy for us to reactivate a tested uh, a process that we'd used during Ebola, and that's what we did from the 23rd of March. Thank you. Can we move on then, please, to the initial period of the pandemic? Um, can we display INQ 30147237, please? Um, is this the first briefing that Public Health Wales sent out in relation to, um, at the time, an unknown uh, pneumonia from, from Wuhan City? And this was based on a similar briefing that had been received from Public Health England. Is that right? That's correct. Um, can we see there um, the intended audience included Public Health Wales protection teams, CDSE consultants, scientists and microbiologists, health board directors of public health, medical directors, um, and also uh, that was for dis dissemination to emergency departments and leads of infection prevention and control, uh, and at the bottom also the Welsh Government. That's correct. And was that briefing circulated to everyone on that list? Yes, it was. Can we see then below, please, in the background information section, that on the 31st of December 2019, um, the World Health Organization was informed by People's Republic of China of cases of pneumonia of unknown microbial etiology associated with Wuhan City, China. At the last report to WHO on the 3rd of January 2020, there were 44 cases, of which 11 were reported as severely ill. In the next paragraph, we can see that on the 5th of January 2020, 59 cases were reported, <coughs> including seven critically ill patients, but no deaths. The first case became unwell on the 12th of December 2019, with the onset date of the last case being on the 29th of December 2019. And it says, current reports describe no evidence of significant human-to-human -human transmission, including no infections of healthcare workers. What was the significance, if anything, of, of, of that? OK, well, <clears throat> I think the key point is the um, absence at that time of evidence of significant human-to-human -human transmission. So we had a new infection, unknown um, uh, etiology, uh, and it had not apparently transmitted from one person to another also says that um, influenza, adenovirus, SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV had been ruled out, but it says it was possible that this cluster represented the emergence of a novel pathogen. What was the significance of that, please? Um, well, clearly, uh, in East Asia, uh, with its past history of infections, um, particularly uh, avian influenza, SARS-CoV-1, MERS, uh, those uh, were the obvious candidates that needed to be investigated first. And of course, those had been uh, by that time ruled out. Uh, investigations, as it says, into other pathogen causes uh, were ongoing. Um, and that uh, suggested that the uh, emergence of this new cluster uh, was caused by a new pathogen. The fact that it, it may have been a, a novel pathogen, did that mean that it was possible that um, we wouldn't have any existing medication or vaccinations available for it, and that it was likely that there wouldn't be any existing immunity in the population? That's correct. Um, I mean, it, we had at that stage yet to characterise what that new uh, pathogen was, uh, but a working assumption is that if you... Uh, don't know what it is, uh, it is a new pathogen, then it is very likely that existing therapies um, uh, might not work, um, that uh, you won't have a vaccine, um, and that the population could be naive to this pathogen. Thank you. And over the page, please. Um, is it right that whilst the cluster was not thought to be avian influenza, um, that had been reported in the region? And so there were some recommendations of how to treat cases if avian influenza risk factors were present. But below that, it says if those factors were not present, that the patient should be managed in respiratory isolation 
using the local protect personal protective equipment protocol for airborne infections, incorporating a fit-tested FFP3 mask and eye protection. And it goes on to say testing was to be undertaken in containment level three. So is it the case that from the very beginning, that whilst it was not known what kind of virus this was, out of an abundance of caution, it was being treated as if it was an airborne, high-consequence infectious disease. Yes, and that's what you would expect uh, to be the case. And uh, what you see there is uh, a clear statement, what we would expect in infection prevention and control terms uh, from uh, any NHS organisation in the UK. This was uh, obviously taken from a Public Health England document anywhere in Wales and the UK. Uh, should that, um, uh, th should this sim uh, disease present itself? In module, module one, we heard that um, pre-pandemic, Wales did not have um, itself any isolation units. Um, well, as at be, the 8th uh, yeah. of January, can you tell us, ha had that situation changed? Um, sorry, just to make absolutely clear, it, we did not have in Wales a high-consequence infectious diseases Thank you. unit. Um, all our acute hospitals um, had isolation facilities, um, but as you will also recall from my Module 1 evidence, uh, an audit conducted in 2017 had suggested that not all of those isolation units uh, satisfied uh, our expectations. Uh, so um, uh, I, I guess the key uh, point here is we were treating this as a new high-consequence infectious disease and we would respond accordingly. Uh, within Wales, uh, which meant uh, that we would normally um, move the patient, if that was our suspicion, suspicion, to a unit in England. So just to be absolutely clear, Dr Sandifer, is it the case that um, as at the 8th of January 2020, first of all, there were no HCID units within Wales? That's correct. And secondly, that there were no satisfactory isolation units in Wales? Uh, no, that second point is not correct. Uh, what I'm perhaps not saying very clearly is we had isolation facilities in all acute hospitals, uh, but um, our audit had suggested that further work was required in some of those settings uh, to uh, achieve, for example, a level of negative pressure uh, isolation within the room that one would expect. So, so just to amend my question in that case, there were no isolation units that were satisfactory to be able to, to, to house HCID patients? Um, I would put it this way, that we, would not, uh, that we might um, temporarily uh, place a patient in an isolation unit in an acute hospital in Wales, but with the expectation that they would move to an appropriately equipped uh, high-consequence infectious diseases unit elsewhere. And how many level three containment laboratories um, were in Wales at that time? Um, the exact number I'm not sure, but the containment level three was in most of our principal laboratories. Uh, so I know that for certain Cardiff, Swansea and Rill in North Wales had containment level three uh, laboratory facilities. Um, page three of this document uh, provides further information about Chinese New Year falling on the 25th of January. Um, I don't believe that information is contained in the Public Health England briefing. Why did you think that that was um, significant enough to include in the Public Health Wales briefing? Um, because uh, I was well aware personally and uh, I think it's generally well known that within China you will see a very large movement of people uh, returning home um, for the Chinese New Year, uh, and that likewise could also be associated with very large international travel. Thank you. Can we move on to the 9th of January, please, and display INQ 30147259, please? Um, is this an email that you received, um, Dr. Sandifer, from Dr. Jiri Shankar, who is the professional lead consultant for health protection at Public Health Wales? 
uh, and this email included a summary of an incident management team meeting convened by Public Health England that he had attended earlier that day. That's correct. And did that email set out the main points arising for that meeting, which I'll just take you through? At paragraph 1B, is it right that um, who had reported that morning that a novel coronavirus had been isolated from one of the affected cases? Yes, that was the new information. And we now understood that this novel virus appeared to be of the coronavirus family. And it was potentially zoonotic? Uh, yes. At that time, there was still no evidence of person-to-person -person transmission or evidence of transmission to healthcare workers, is that correct? That's right. At paragraph two, can we see that Public Health England had decided to respond to this as an enhanced incident because of it, because of it being a novel coronavirus as with, sorry, with um, as yet unknown consequences. Yes. And it says that the agent and incident was being managed as a high consequence infectious disease, which That's I correct. think you say was an appropriate approach. Yes. Um, just pausing there. Um, so we have now the identification of a novel coronavirus. Um, the inquiry heard in module one that coronaviruses generally were known to cause mild respiratory illness, or also known as the common cold. However, it's right, isn't it, that there had been two past global outbreaks caused by coronaviruses, SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, which had caused severe disease, which was transmissible from person to person, and which were both classified as HCIDs. Is that correct? That's correct. So how much of a concern was it to you to learn that a novel coronavirus had been identified? Um, I think I just simply um, noted what the um, uh, situation was at that time. Uh, clearly, I was thinking, um, well, uh, is this a variant of the um, SARS or a, a MERS? We were all thinking that. Uh, but uh, I don't uh, actually think that would have fundamentally changed any of the, the decisions or actions we were taking then. What we were doing is reporting what we were observing. Uh, it should be said we were still dealing with something in one city, in one province in China, uh, reporting that uh, here in the context of the United Kingdom and specifically here in Wales. Um, the inquiry heard that um, very few cases of SARS and MERS reached the UK during those outbreaks. Are you able to assist us as to how many cases, if any, reached Wales? Um, I don't think there were any SARS-CoV-1 cases in Wales. I'm not absolutely sure on that point. I wasn't working in Wales at that time. Um, with the 2015 uh, outbreak of uh, MERS-CoV in South Korea, and indeed through the period since um, MERS-CoV was first identified, I, I think from memory we had two contacts, suspected contacts in Wales. Uh, during those years, um, and those, I believe, were ruled out as uh, uh, confirmed cases. Thank you. Um, and at paragraph six of this document, um, can we see there under diagnostics, it says, PHE's respiratory virus unit have a well-developed and well-tested pan-coronavirus assay that should detect most coronaviruses. Um, Am I right in understanding that, that your evidence is that um, Wales did have at this time uh, level three labs which would also be able to test for coronaviruses once yes. PHE had, had, had developed that assay? Uh, sorry, so we just need to separate out. Uh, PHE um, had uh, the assay at that date, yes. the 9th of January. We had the laboratories that could conduct um, this test uh, we didn't have the assay That's for right. this, for coronavirus here in Wales at that time. Could you just explain what you mean by assay? So this is the test itself, if you like, the diagnostic test, my Thank lady. You. And over the page, can we see there a reference to the situation being rapidly evolving? There will be lots of changes to guidance, advice, documents, etc. 
Public Health England have asked for cooperation from the devolved administrations on this and offer quick turnaround on issues that require four-nation agreement. Is that right? Uh, that's right. And it might be just worth us all, um, uh, me just reminding us here, uh, Public Health England were designated a national focal point for the UK government under the International Health Regulations 2005. So they would have received any notification to the WHO, and uh, they therefore would have taken the lead in sharing that information and any immediate action uh, that arose from that within the United Kingdom. Thank you. Um, can we then display, please, INQ 00147262? And this was uh, the briefing note on the 10th of January 2020, where Public Health Wales was relaying the information that had been passed on the previous day by Dr Shankar. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, yes. On page two, the last paragraph, can we see there the advice on what to do with patients with respiratory symptoms um, and the reference to transferring them to a single occupancy room preferably a respiratory isolation room, ideally under negative pressure. Um, so is it right that, as at this date, patients were being transferred to England to be held in um, HCID units? Do, do you think that the briefing at this time should have advised health boards to start preparing their own isolation units which would have been sufficient to house HCID patients? Um, sorry, I can just um, correct something yes, you said. Yes, of course. Um, uh, the UK government uh, was not asking for patients to be transferred uh, from China. What this statement... No, no, sorry, this, this is in relation to patients from in Wales. Yes. So you are, are advising, aren't you, that um, if there are any patients in Wales who have symptoms, yes. that they should be held in isolation um, units, preferably negative pressure ones. And you've told us that those patients would have had to have been transferred from Wales to England. Yes. Is that right? So my question was, do you think at this time you should have been advising health boards to start getting ready to have their own satisfactory units to be able to house HCID patients? So this briefing was intended to alert the health boards to the fact that the isolation rooms, which would have met the requirements we were asking for, um, that they ought to take notice of what was happening and be aware that they might need to use those isolation rooms. Is it right that the... Sorry. The first suspected case in Wales was on the 16th of January 2020. That's correct. And you provided a briefing note to the Public Health Wales Board on that day. In fact, I think, sorry, let me just correct that. The suspected case was on the 15th and you, and you reported it on the 16th, is that right? That's correct. And, and that, that time it was sorry. negative, the test. Yes, and, and, and that patient was a 67-year-old female Welsh resident in North Wales whose husband worked in Wuhan City, and she was, in fact, transferred from a hospital in Wales to specialist facilities in Liverpool. Is that right? Uh, she was transferred, yes, to a, a specialist facility in Liverpool. Um, and you're right to say that that was negative. The test was negative, yes. yes. You had, or Public Health Wales had, um, its first meeting with the, the Chief Medical Officer um, of Wales on the 21st of January 2020. That was 12 days after the novel coronavirus had been discovered. Do you think that was soon enough? Um, so just to um, wind back a little bit, um, the UK IMT, established and chaired by Public Health England from the 9th of January was attended by members of my team, Dr. Giri Shankar, whom you've referred to, as well as a senior medical officer from Welsh Government. Uh, we were having daily conversations at that and from that time with the Welsh Government senior medical officer and other senior officials in the chief medical officer's team. Um, and uh, those were happening on a daily basis. Now, I can't remember the first 
time I spoke to the chief medical officer about this, uh, but um, in case there's any misunderstanding from your question, there was regular daily uh, communications already taking place between my senior team and the chief medical officer's team. Thank you. It's right, isn't it, that on the 22nd of January 2020, Public Health Wales invoked its emergency plan at an enhanced level? Yes. Um, we know that Public Health England had been um, responding to this as at an enhanced level since the 9th of January. Do you think that Public Health Wales should have moved to that sooner? No, I don't think necessarily. Uh, Public Health England, uh, you know, in the face of a potential high-consequence infectious disease alert, um, it was entirely correct that they would immediately go to an enhanced level. Um, as I say, we were in daily contact, uh, not just... Uh, uh, we were in attended the daily IMTs, the incident management teams, with Public Health England. And the reason we stood up uh, our Public Health um, Emergency Response Plan on the 22nd is because the sheer volume of work that had by then arisen from that engagement as a member of the Four Nations IMT necessitated us to start thinking beyond the immediate resources of our Public Health Protection Service. The um, Public Health Wales response plan had envisaged a silver group being established at the same time as yep. an enhanced uh, level response being invoked. Why wasn't that done on the same day? So, um, I don't think that there's any particular significance should be attached to a six-day uh, difference. What we were doing, as I say, uh, uh, apologies if I keep repeating myself, is we were in daily contact with Public Health England, we were in daily contact with the Welsh Government, work was building up, uh, we necessitated, therefore, um, uh, additional, we well, envisaged additional resources would be required to support us. We uh, invoked the emergency response plan. We established our own IMT on the 23rd, again at enhanced, uh, uh, consistent with uh, Public Health England. Um, but we could see that that group itself would n necessitate additional tactical level support. Um, and so, you know, we were talking about over the period of the weekend, uh, bringing together uh, additional support, and that was uh, established in the form of the Silver Group. Um, so the fact that uh, Silver Group didn't actually, uh, wasn't established until Tuesday, uh, as far as I'm concerned, had no material uh, impact on uh, our response. We were delivering the response, the Silver Group, was an additional element that would assist us with that. Uh, and it was better to make sure that we could establish that. And, and just to be clear, when you establish something like a, a silver group, it's not just a case of convening a meeting. We have to put human resource behind that. And that resource has to be rostered in a way that it's sustainable to be able to deliver the function set for that group. So this was not just a case of, oh, we better just convene a group. It doesn't work like that. Uh, you mentioned there the Public Health Wales IMT, which was established on the 23rd of January. And is it right that that was set up to assess and manage the information and consequential actions arising from the Public Health England-led IMT and to undertake Welsh-specific surveillance and risk assessment and to provide public health technical advice on plans for responding to possible cases in Wales? Do you think that it would have been helpful to set up this Wales-specific IMT prior to the 23rd of January? And had it been, would there have been a bit more of a head start on making Wales-specific plans? Uh, no and no to both, to be quite frank. Uh, the, the point that I'm repeatedly trying to make is uh, that we were undertaking all the actions that I think were required and that an IMT uh, in due course uh, formalised um, right from the beginning. So I don't think it would have made any difference to have declared an IMT uh, at the same time, for example, as Public Health England. We were doing what we needed to do already.
Thank you. Can we look at uh, another briefing that was sent out on the same day, the 23rd of January? This is INQ 30147265. We'll just wait for that to come up. And can we see there the um, intended audience, as well as the, the, the previous intended recipients this time, also included GPs, health boards, the Welsh Ambulance Service Trust, and Port Health Authorities, as well as the Welsh Government? Can you see that? I can, yes. And um, if we look at the last paragraph of that page... We can see there it says, due to the enlarging geographic area affected and evidence of human to human transmission, it is increasingly likely that suspected cases, those with an appropriate clinical picture and travel or contact exposure, will be identified in the UK, including Wales. Is that right? That's correct. And on page two, can we see um, a section titled Recommendations and Actions? Health boards should ensure their preparedness for a possible case of the, this novel coronavirus, including provision, training and appropriate use of personal protective equipment and isolation facilities. The current guidance is for assessment in an airborne isolation unit in hospital, followed by testing and a period of isolation at home or in hospital whilst awaiting the results. Was this the first time that Public Health Wales had formally asked health boards to start preparing these isolation facilities in Wales? Uh, I go back to my previous comment with reference to the briefing on the 10th. Uh, by drawing attention to the need uh, for any patients uh, with uh, suspected of having this infection uh, to be uh, cared for or um, housed in, as you put it, uh, an isolation room, uh, we were already signalling that intent um, two weeks earlier. Uh, all we were doing is providing additional uh, clarification to that. Uh, I mean, could I just, um, uh, again, reference my module uh, one, uh, remind you that we had uh, conducted um, training, an update refresher training for the health boards and the ambulance trust in September 2019 uh, on managing high consequence infectious diseases uh, and the use of uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and so if you like, this uh, paragraph is just simply to remind them that there were a large number of people in health boards uh, that could deal with these cases um, pending their transfer, of course, to a, another facility uh, and to um, uh, start to prepare themselves accordingly. Um, could I just refer back, please, to your evidence in Module 1? Um, if we could bring up the transcript to PHT and it, um, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, I think it's 8014. And it's the transcript from the 4th of July 2023 at page 78. Um, can we see there that you say that in January 2020, as it became clear to us in Public Health Wales, the novel coronavirus represented a very serious threat. We as an organisation entered into discussions with Welsh Government and with one of our local health boards to discuss how we could establish very quickly a high consequence infectious disease unit at that hospital in advance of and in readiness for potential patients if novel coronavirus came to Wales. So, so in, in your Module 1 evidence, you were saying that you had entered discussions with one health board, is that right? That's right, the University Hospital of Wales, just down the road from here. Um, can we turn to your statement in this module, uh, page 35, paragraph 145? Three lines up, up from the bottom. You say, I was acutely aware that we lacked the authority to direct the NHS in Wales to establish capacity and capability to support initial assessment and sampling of suspected cases. And then at page 38, paragraph 157, 
you refer to um, rapid scaling up, requiring a system response under national leadership, with authority to direct, supported by access to reserve workforce, including volunteers that can be mobilised quickly. Um, is it right that um, without the national strategic leadership in place at this time, that Public Health Wales was not in a position to direct the NHS or local health boards to prepare in the way that they needed to be doing? I mean, let me just start by stating that paragraph 157 is obviously a reflection after the event. Uh, so this is me looking back uh, uh, and uh, summarising uh, what I strongly believe now, but even at the time. Uh, the challenge we were facing, the previous point that you highlighted, uh, the authority to direct comment, was with reference to the fact that during the week beginning the 27th of January, we were asking, asking directly health boards um, to uh, begin to prepare themselves so that if we had a suspected case, they were able to appropriately sample, assess and sample that patient, hold them whilst uh, um, the sample was taken, uh, tested uh, uh, by our laboratories, and then if we confirmed the infection, we would have uh, arranged for the transfer of that patient uh, to a high-consequence infectious disease unit. Now, um, in order to do that, we were having discussions, uh, and we were asking them to do that, but at that stage, by the end of January, we were becoming very, very concerned. We had had by then a second suspected case, also tested negative, and I was looking for some urgency. And that, quite frankly, I can't tell the chief exec of a health board or an NHS trust in Wales what they must do. Uh, and this, what was in my mind was that, that that was a function that the director general stroke chief exec of the NHS in Wales uh, could have done. And that was what I'm referring to by national leadership, is from the Welsh government's health and social services group. Thank you. Can we look at INQ 30147264, please? Um, this is a written report that was presented in private session to the Public Health Wales Board um, the day after the briefing that we looked at before. And at page four, paragraph... I'm sorry, if I could just correct yes. that. <laughs> a quirk of the, the word process in software is that it was actually written on the 22nd for the board meeting on the 23rd. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, by the time it was um, uh, captured by my board secretary, uh, it had auto-dated to the 24th in the top right of the document. So just to be clear... I see. So it's written on the 22nd. For a board meeting on the 23rd. Thank you for that clarification. So this was presented to the board on the 24th. And if we look at page four, please... On the 23rd. On the 23rd, sorry. On uh, page four, paragraph five, can we see there that there's reference to there being no confirmed cases in, in, in the UK but there had been five possible cases in the UK, including Wales, at that time. Is that right? Two had tested negative and three um, the tests were awaited for. That's correct. Um, so, so when the briefing went out then, the day after you had written this to the Welsh Government, um, why didn't you include the information that there had already been five suspected cases, including some in Wales. Do, do you think that that information would have been significant information to include in the briefing to the government? Uh, the government already knew that. We were in discussion with them uh, at the time. What about the NHS and the health boards? Um, uh, I guess we could have added. Uh, I don't think there was a... Uh, quite frankly, I, I'm... I'm I'm not quite sure what the, the additional significance of adding that in, but um, clearly we, if we didn't add it in, then that's an oversight, but I don't think it was a, a material matter. Do, do you think that they might have acted with any more urgency if they thought that there were already cases in Wales that were suspected? Uh, 
So there was one case, suspected case, that had already been tested negative as of this date. The second case was on the 25th, so after this date. Um, uh, I don't think it would have made any significant difference. I mean, as I said, we were meeting with the health boards the following week, um, and we were trying to explain to them what, the, uh, rec what we then thought they should be doing. Um, and uh, I don't think that simply adding that line in would have made any difference to those conversations. Thank you. Um, we didn't hold any information back, if, to be absolutely clear here. Uh, we didn't withhold any information from the, the health boards. Thank you. And I, I'm not suggesting that you deliberately withheld any information. Um, is it right that on the 24th of January 2020, there was the first confirmed case in Europe... Yes, in and, France. And if we display INQ 30147245, please. On the 24th of January 2020, you received an email from um, a Welsh government official, David Goulding, who was the health emergency planning <coughs> advisor. Is that right? That's and, correct. Yeah. Um, at the bottom of page one, can we see there that he says, Public Health Wales is part of the um, L LRF structure and have in the past arranged a Wales briefing of LRF partners facilitated by Quentin. This was at the height of the Ebola risk, and I don't think we're at that point. If necessary, Public Health Wales could consider a similar approach to briefing LRF rep representatives. Um, at the top of the page, can we see... Um, another email where he says, Hi, Quentin, see attached emails. I don't think we are at the point of needing a meeting similar to what you did before, but thought to alert you to the possibility. Um, following this email, did you have a meeting with the local resilience forums? OK, so we just need to unpack a few things and what was happening uh, at the time. Uh, so first of all, this email uh, from David Golden was prompted by an approach that I my deputy made to him at my request. My deputy was acting as a direct liaison between Public Health Wales and Welsh Government. Essentially, uh, I asked him uh, to um, embed himself uh, part-time in Welsh Government uh, so he could, in real time, keep them abreast of what we were doing and, uh, and feed back to us in turn what Welsh Government uh, Chief Medical Officer's team were doing. And uh, as of the 24th, as you correctly uh, uh, pointed out, France had uh, reported the first case in uh, Europe. Um, and it occurred to me uh, that we might want at that stage to start thinking about uh, public health emergency planning uh, using civil contingencies. Um, so, um, my deputy had uh, uh, approached David and I got a response back, as you see in this email. Now, that paragraph in bold at the bottom uh, references the um, structure that we talked about earlier, the P Public Health Wales, Public Health Strategic Coordinating Support Group, which we did establish in due course, as I explained. We were already briefing the LRF coordinators directly, however, by this time. Thank you. And if we um, look at page two, can we see there it says the four nations is treating this as an enhanced public health incident and arrangements are in hand for dealing with potential cases and the NHS has plans for high consequence infectious disease. The risk to the UK is assessed as low. I don't see this event as it is currently moving from being in the public health outbreak management space and into the civil contingency, multi-agency emergency response. Did, did you agree with Mr Gordon's view that this event was unlikely to move into becoming a civil emergency? Well, as I say, this email was prompted by the fact that I was asking him as the health emergency planning lead... Um, whether, in the light of the events uh, elsewhere in Europe, we ought to start thinking about uh, civil contingencies and emergency response. And um, this was his uh, opinion. Um, I think uh, it was at 
8.04 in the morning on the 24th of January. We could have had a debate uh, around that, but you know, my mind was already in the space of perhaps we needed to start thinking about civil contingency, uh, and this is the response uh, he gave me. Uh, I, I don't think it was as black and white as, okay, there's a case in France, stand up our emergency um, plans in Wales. Um, this email um, in the first line refers to the four nations treating this at this stage, 24th of January, as an enhanced public health incident. Do you think that if Public Health Wales at this stage had escalated it to a major incident, as far as Public Health Wales is concerned, that the government might have taken it more seriously? I don't think so. Um, I think Dr Cooper um, addressed this question uh, yesterday. Um, our Public Health Wales response plan uh, directs our internal Public Health Wales actions. Uh, if we'd gone to a major incident, we were just simply saying uh, uh, we desperately need to mobilise more resources internally. Well, we were doing that anyway, and I don't think uh, that that uh, would have signalled to anyone outside the organisation that they in turn ought to take uh, different action. I think it would only simply have confused the situation. We were responding consistent with Public Health England at enhanced level, mobilising rapidly within Public Health Wales, uh, engaging with, uh, directly with Welsh Government and engaging by then also with health boards. I, I'm not sure it would have made any difference. Um, how would it have confused the situation? Well, because if one organisation at this stage with one case uh, that might not actually be generally uh, known uh, to people. One case in Europe uh, confirmed that earlier in that same day, um, they would have perhaps <coughs> asked themselves, well, what's Public Health Wales doing, suddenly activating its, uh, uh, its mer uh, emergency response plan uh, at uh, a major incident level? Um, what I needed, really, was... Uh, if you like, um, a clearer signal that uh, what we were discussing already with them, that they were taking the necessary actions, uh, as um, I, we've discussed in uh, reference to the paper the previous day before the briefing that I had sent out. Thank you. Um, the very next day, there was the second suspected case in Wales, is that right? And at that time, was the testing for that being done in England or in Wales? It was uh, in England at that stage. All the test samples were going from Wales to Collindale Laboratory in North London. So by this stage, Public Health England had the assay. Um, why wasn't it being, being done in Wales at this time? Uh, well, um, as has, I think, already been covered, but I'll happily... Just to remind everyone, um, we got the uh, genomic sequence for this virus, new virus, uh, in mid-January. We also ordered primers uh, and probes, which are the necessary elements that you need, my lady, to make a test. Um, we ordered those on the 16th of January, and the laboratory in, in Cardiff uh, was already starting to develop a Welsh assay. Uh, and that process um, continued uh, through till the 31st, uh, by which time we were then uh, uh, using that as a test alongside the Public Health England test. So at the same time as we were sending a test to Collindale, we were uh, undertaking the same test in our laboratory. But um, the previous week, we had uh, approached the Chief Medical Officer and said, look, We've started to develop uh, a Welsh test. Um, it's not clear to us how quickly the UK test will be rolled out across the UK. Uh, turnaround times for getting test results was now approaching about 48 hours. So therefore, um, could we use this test that we have developed, which was given us the same results, by the way, uh, as we applied it from the end of January to those uh, received from Public Health England, could we start to apply that? And as the Chief Medical Officer explained on Monday, he sought some assurances from us. 
Some of those assurances uh, were basic actions that we would have taken anyway. We produced a full set of standard operating procedures. We would do that for any uh, introduced new test. Uh, but we agreed and indeed did submit a paper to NERVTAG, which was considered on the 3rd of February. And then by the end of that week, the 7th of February, the chief medical officer was satisfied that the Welsh test uh, was uh, OK. They proved it in a letter to the chief medical officer. Uh, and we therefore stopped sending tests to England at that point. And immediately, our turnaround time fell from 48 hours to a few hours, depending on how quickly the sample got to the lab. So from the 7th of February, you were conducting tests in Wales. Yes. In your view, could that process that you've just described have been done any faster? Uh, not really. I mean, there's an awful lot of work starting from uh, a, a sequence provided by the World Health Organization um, uh, to um, developing the actual test itself. And our consultant clinical scientists who led this, I think, did an absolutely cracking job pulling this together in less than a fortnight. Thank you. Um, sticking to the 25th of January for now, on this day, the World Health Organization issued a statement outlining the importance of being ready at local and national levels for detecting cases, testing samples and clinical management. From your point of view, how ready was Wales at the local and national levels? Sorry, at what date are we this now? This is the 25th of January. Um, at the 25th of January, um, we were, as an organisation, Public Health Wales, uh, you know, fully engaged in the preparatory work for this. And we had, uh, uh, and the following week, we were, as I say, engaged in the discussions. So if a case had arrived, we would have managed it. I am very confident in uh, a, 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 an appropriate and effective way. Uh, but as uh, to regards to the overall state of readiness, that was still work in progress. Thank you. Um, can we move on to the 26th of January, please, the next day, and INQ 30252016. Um, these are the minutes from a meeting that, that Public Health Wales had with the Welsh Government on this day to agree strategic aims and actions. Is that right? Yeah, this is Sunday, the 26th of January, and I suggested to the Chief Medical Officer uh, that we got together now and uh, uh, agreed... Uh, our overall strategic approach to what we were observing elsewhere still at this stage. I emphasise that last point. So he brought a couple of his senior colleagues. I had a couple of my senior team, uh, and we sat round the table and asked ourselves, well, what were the strategic aims we should be aiming for at this stage? Thank you. And um, if we look at agenda item two, we can see that at this time... There had been 52 cases tested in England, all negative, and two tested cases in Wales, also negative. Is that right? That's right. The um, second negative case result had only just come through that morning. If we look at page two in the first section, um, can we see there that there was a discussion about um, a proposal being circulated for the case definition to be amended to expand the affected geographical area? So was it anticipated that that would increase significantly the number of suspected cases in Wales and in the UK generally? Yes, yeah, so um, the case definitions are discussed at a UK level, led by Public Health England, um, and that in turn, on the basis of information that was coming out of the WHO. Um, so yes, to the answer to your question is, every case definition uh, invariably... Uh, expanded the potential numbers uh, of uh, people that could present uh, as suspected cases. Thank you. And at page five, <clears throat> top of the page, can we see that any confirmed case would be expected to, man to, be, to be managed outside of Wales as guided by the imported fever service to HCID units? So at this time any positive cases were still being sent outside of Wales? Would have been sent. Uh, uh, any confirmed cases would have been sent outside of Wales to a HCID unit in England. 
can we see in the middle of the page it says cross government not meeting over the weekend um, bearing in mind that this was a rapidly evolving situation you've told us the hours that you and your colleagues were working do you think it was appropriate for that, um, for that meeting not to have taken place over the weekend I, I think this is a matter as you say it's an update from Welsh government it's a matter for Welsh government to answer page six Item six, can we see there that it's stated that this is an NHS incident at present, can be strategically managed accordingly and doesn't currently require civil contingencies response. So at this stage, the government still did not think that it was a civil emergency. That's correct. <laughs> and at page seven, action log item two, which was um, in relation to testing and isolation capacity and so on, agreed to remain with reactive approach. Do you think that at this stage, the decision to remain with a reactive approach was the right one? Um, I mean, with hindsight and reading these notes again, I'm not quite sure uh, I understand what we're, we're saying. I'm assuming what this refers to is that we need to be alert to and respond to suspected cases in the way that we had already been doing for a fortnight by uh, that, almost a fortnight by that stage. And I'm assuming that is uh, what we're referring to. I mean, I had already uh, inquired, as you uh, know, and we've discussed with Welsh Government whether we ought to start thinking about uh, civil contingencies. And I, as we've already discussed, had received a response. Do you think you and the government should have been more proactive at this stage? So, absolutely, my point being that we were proactive. There is nothing else that Public Health Wales could or needed to have done at this stage. Uh, the decision to have activated civil contingencies was a decision uh, for Welsh Government. It's right, isn't it, that on the 27th of January 2020, and this is after you say the momentum had started changing, uh, that two additional backup strategic directors were appointed and you became the lead strategic director at that stage. Um, and it was the next day, the 28th of January 2020, when the Silver Group was established. Um, you've told us that you don't think that would have, establishing that sooner would have made any difference. Is that right? No, that was, um, if you like, uh, uh, an action that we needed, uh, that we took internally in order to support uh, tactically to support the response that we were already mobilising within the organisation. The fact that we um, got that process in place, properly established at that date, uh, I think uh, is neither, um, you know, even with reflection, I don't think it would have made any difference if we had simply convened that uh, immediately when we uh, invoked the plan. It's right, isn't it, that on the 30th of January, the World Health Organisation declared a public health emergency of international concern, and uh, the UK had its first two cases of COVID-19, which were um, announced on the 31st of January. That's correct. Can we look at, please, INQ 30147267? Um, this was you updating the board about um, the, the WHO declaring a fake and the UK risk level being raised from low to moderate and you're expecting the case definition to change. Is that right? That's correct. And if we look at section two, first paragraph, can we see that it was agreed... At the, it's, it's towards the bottom of the first paragraph. It, it's agreed that at the present time... This is a health-led incident, and Public Health Wales, alongside Welsh Government, is leading the response. So even after um, COVID-19 has been uh, declared to be a public health emergency of international concern, is it right that the government was still seeing this as a health-led incident and was not taking charge of leading the national response? It is the case that uh, Welsh Government was considering this a health-led incident, um, and that uh, the principal um, leadership, as I could see it, was coming from the chief medical officer. 
How seriously do you think the Welsh Government has taken this threat at this time? I think the 31st of January, um, even at the time, it, it really felt like a, 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 a seminal moment. I mean, the Chief Medical Officer of the United Kingdom standing up and saying we've got the first two um, cases in the UK just about a month after it was first reported by China to the WHO. It, it just felt to me like this was a, uh, a, an inflection point in, in, in the whole, um, uh, as, as we would subsequently call it, the pandemic, in the emergence of this outbreak. And uh, I personally was start, starting to get very concerned now about the extent to which I could see, beyond the chief medical officer, uh, a response from Welsh Government. Um, you've told us that the testing um, in Wales was established on the 7th of February. Was approved it, on the 7th. Sorry, approved on the 7th. And we were right? already applying the test from the 31st of January in parallel with the test in... Thank you. So the after that date, it was done exclusively in Wales? After the 7th of February, it was done exclusively in Wales. And in your statement, you say that at that point, the challenge then returned to community sampling. Could you just briefly explain what that challenge was, please? Yeah, so um, I think Dr Cooper described this really well. That it's an end-to-end -end process. Somebody has to take a sample, a microbiological sample. Our laboratory would... Uh, conduct the test, and then that result needs to get back to the um, uh, 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 clinician uh, who ordered the test. Now, that front end uh, requires um, clinicians uh, in health boards to take a sample. Uh, and as I've already said uh, in my evidence this morning, we had begun that discussion uh, earlier in that week, uh, the week commencing the 27th of January, with health boards uh, in order to try and get them to take on that responsibility. Now, the significance of that is that the first two cases, um, or suspected cases, sorry to correct myself, the first two suspected cases were attended by senior staff from the Health Protection Service in Public Health Wales. And indeed, whilst we were having those discussions with uh, health boards, um, w the whole of Wales, the whole geography of Wales, was dependent on a handful of senior consultants from my team being able, uh, in response to concerns about a suspected case, uh, attending the patient anywhere in Wales, clinically assessing them, taking a sample, and getting that sample back to Cardiff. It was that front end of the process, which was unsustainable. You know, a handful of people could never do that if this were to start now uh, increasing in any numbers in Wales. And we had no idea how quickly this might spread, even at that stage. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, so that's the reference uh, that I made uh, before and now to the uh, mobilisation of testing uh, sorry, sampling capability. Thank you. And um, is it right that on the 10th of February 2020, the Chief Medical Officer for Wales issued a letter to health board chief executives requesting that every health board develop community assessment and testing plans and that each health board must have coronavirus testing units separate from emergency departments and that those arrangements were to be operational as soon as practically possible and by lo no later than Friday the 14th of February. Yes, and that was in response to our frustration and concern at the pace at which the health boards were putting together their sampling uh, capacity. Uh, and if you like, the Chief Medical Officer's letter represented the direction which I thought he had the authority to give rather than me. And should that have been issued earlier than it was? Um, it might have been helpful if that had been issued at the beginning of February or even if I had decided uh, not to bother to try and have a conversation and see if we can get this by negotiation with the health boards. We could have done it the previous week. But I think, frankly, that would have been inappropriate, certainly after the 31st when we had the first two cases. I think that did represent a turning point and maybe the following week 
um, some direction uh, at that stage would have been really helpful. Thank you. My lady, would that be a convenient It time would, for certainly. Um, 11.30-ish, 11.31. <laughs>Thank you, my lady. Um, Dr Sandifer, could I start, please, with a correction? Um, when we were discussing the meeting that took place between you and the um, Chief Medical Officer for Wales on the 26th of January, do you remember we looked at the minutes for that meeting? Yes. And I put to you that the action in relation to um, testing and other things was to remain with a reactive approach. I'm told that that specific action was in relation to communications but the agenda item also related, also um, was in relation to diagnostics and case management. Do you know what the actions were in relation to those? Um, so thank you for that uh, clarification. That would make uh, sense, reactive communication. Um, and I'm assuming that the second part is uh, with reference to the fact that um, uh, our laboratories were ready to respond uh, uh, to test any suspected cases. Thank you. Um, is it right that the Gold Group was set up on the 25th of February and that was two days before the first confirmed case in Wales? That's correct. Do you think that should have been set up earlier? Uh, I don't think so. At the time, um, as strategic director, it's the discretion of the strategic director when to establish the gold group. Um, the reason that I hadn't was that I was discharging all the functions of the strategic director sufficiently without necessitating uh, convening a gold group. But by the 25th of February, the sheer scale and volume of the actions and activities we're involved in uh, prompted me uh, at that stage to convene the group um, when I did. So uh, I didn't think it was necessary beforehand because I was pretty well doing that full time anyway. Thank you. Can we look at INQ 30252365, please? Uh, this is an email thread that was put to Dr. Chris Williams um, last Friday. Uh, and it's an email thread regarding um, PHE modelling work between Dr Williams, Andrew Jones, yourself and uh, Rob Orford. Can we see there it says in the middle of the page, uh, mm -hmm. it, this is in fact you saying, we should avoid calling it a, a STAC, it isn't, and what we need is the same level of urgency as it seems is happening in PHE, DHSE. W what did you mean by that? OK, so the first part is, um, I'm afraid, me being a little pedantic. Uh, STAC stands for a Scientific Technical Advisory Cell. It's a construct described in emergency planning guidance to support strategic coordinating groups. Those were being established at this time, but what uh, I understood Welsh Government was doing was uh, establishing what came to be known as TAC uh, and TAG. So, uh, I was being a little pedantic uh, in making that. <laughs> um, the second part is probably the more uh, relevant here. Um, below that, you will uh, see reference to uh, work that was being undertaken in Public Health England. Um, and I just felt that, um, that uh, the response that I was seeing in Wales at that time to the specific actions that uh, Public Health England uh, were taking uh, was not commensurate and that we needed more urgency. Thank you. Can we look at INQ 30309871, please? Uh, this is an email that you sent to Dr Rob Orford and Dr Tracy Cooper on the 23rd of March 2020 regarding testing, and you said... Above all else, I'm really worried that national politics could trump public safety and need in Wales, and we end up losing ba out badly in Wales. W what did you mean by that? What was your concern about national politics trumping public safety? OK. Um, so this uh, was around <coughs> the time that we were in discussion um, 
with Public Health England about access to tests from Roche. Um, uh, I had been party to some of the discussions with Dr Cooper, um, and I had been copied into most of the emails. And at this date, I had thought that there was an agreement uh, for 5,000 tests uh, to come uh, to Wales. Uh, however, as a uh, little bit further down you'll see, uh, we didn't have that uh, in writing. Now, um, my concern at this stage was that we were going to lose those tests, uh, which of course subsequently events showed we did, and we got about 500 tests. Um, and uh, I was probably stepping out of line by speculating whether there was uh, anything at UK government level uh, that might uh, be behind that, uh, and emphasising my concern about the implications of losing that test capacity on public safety and need in Wales. Thank you. Can I ask you about the Emergency Coordination Centre, Wales, please? Um, is it right that you asked the Welsh Government in January 2020 whether they were going to stand one up? Yes, on the 24th of January, we've discussed that point, which would have been the first signal that perhaps they were invoking civil contingencies. And can we look, please, at INQ 30255778? On the 3rd of March 2020, did you receive this email from Andrew Jones, which sets out... Um, this is not a civil emergency situation, but ECCW is operating in support of the health agenda. This is being kept under review and any change in activation arrangements will be shared as a matter of urgency. This email was then forwarded to you and Dr Shankar the same day. <clears throat> and um, it said the same thing. Um, is that right? Yeah, I was astonished at, at this. I mean, we're beginning of March and um, Welsh Government uh, resilience team were telling us that they didn't think we were uh, approaching, if we weren't already there, uh, a civil emergency. Do you know why they were taking that approach? Um, I think that question needs to be directed to Welsh Government. Uh, what they will point out, um, because I've read others statements <coughs> is that they um, had convened uh, the civil con uh, a civil contingencies group on the 4th of February. Uh, we hadn't received notice of that meeting in advance, but Dr Jones, uh, sorry, Mr Jones, uh, who was my liaison, just happened to be there when that uh, invitation came in and he joined uh, Chief Medical Officer's staff at that meeting. Um, so we knew that there had been uh, a first meeting uh, which would have suggested a level one uh, activation of the Pan Wales response plan. Um, we subsequently learned that ECHO apparently had been stood up, although over time through February it appeared to us that appeared to be operating more as a, a health desk and not in terms of the functions uh, as I uh, read them in the Pan Wales response plan. And the purpose for that, this email chain was that I asked Andrew to go back and say, hang on, are we in? Are we actually using civil emergency powers at this moment? Uh, and uh, here is the response. Uh, and can we look, please, at a, a document that was produced by Public Health Wales, INQ 0001472468. And this is called COVID-19 as a major health incident points to consider. If we look over the page, we can see that at the top it says, this paper summarises the current situation of COVID-19 in Wales and provides an evidential summary of considerations to guide Welsh Government in any decision on the declaration of a major incident for health in Wales. In preparing this paper and before declaring a major incident, two essential questions need to be answered, and this paper considers each in turn. One, why declare a major incident and why now? Two, what would we expect from making a declaration of a major incident? And you go on, don't you, in this paper to deal with three questions. 
we can see the first question there, why declare a major incident and why now? And you set out the factors that need to be co considered. Firstly, the current epidemiological situation. And you set out that um, the summary of confirmed cases in Wales as at 9am on the 11th of March 2020 was that there was 19 cases confirmed from five different health boards. Two, a summary of contact tracing monitoring <clears throat> as at the same time and date, 109 individuals were under contact monitoring over the page. Mm -hmm. And of the 13 cases in Wales who have contacts under surveillance, the mean number of contacts per case was six, but this ranged from zero to 27. And then factor two, characteristics of the population exposed. You set out there that in terms of um, demography, Wales has a higher proportion of the population aged 65 or over compared to the UK. Over the page, Wales has a slightly higher proportion of the population aged 85 or over um, compared to the UK. Wales has 30,000 men aged 85 or over and 52,400 women aged 85 or over. In terms of health status, Wales has a higher proportion of census respondents reporting their health to be not good or very good compared to England. Wales has a higher proportion of census respondents reporting having a limiting long-term illness compared to England. Wales has a high proportion of patients on a number of QOF registers, including asthma and, and, and COPD, diabetes, coronary heart disease and stroke compared to the UK as a whole. Economic status. Wales has a lower proportion of people in employment compared to the UK as a whole. Wales has a higher proportion of people on short and long-term sickness absence compared to the UK as a whole. Wales has a higher proportion of people in Wales employed in service or sales roles compared to the UK as a whole. Wales has a high proportion of lone parent families compared to the UK as a whole. And then dependency, Wales has a high proportion of the adult population that provide care compared to England. Over the page, you say, this gives rise to an important question. Is the Welsh population more vulnerable than comparator populations that would necessitate earlier or different interventions? Objectively, the demographic characteristics of the Welsh population, and specifically the age profile of the population over 65, 75, health and economic status, and dependency responsibilities are such that Wales may experience disproportionate levels of impact from COVID-19. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, factor three you deal with uh, later on in that page, state of the health system in Wales to respond to COVID-19. And you say in the last paragraph, the predictions for the population of Wales are for over 1.5 million symptomatic cases with 200,000 requiring hospital admission an estimated 18,000 will require mechanical ventilation at some point, with 25,000 predicted deaths. Over the page. <clears throat> Older people and those with comorbidities have higher estimated hospitalisation and mortality proportions, so the estimates for Wales referred to above may be higher than the above under the wor a reasonable worst-case scenario. You go on to say that behavioural interventions are planned, including home isolation and household quarantine and cocooning of vulnerable people. And in the next paragraph, nevertheless, and quite apart from any consider of a major incident declaration, given the demography and health status of the population of Wales, Public Health Wales strongly advocates early implementation of these three behaviour interventions and specifically commends urgent attention directed at the elderly population cared for in residential and nursing homes in Wales. Can we see that below that on the same page, you go on to, to ask the second question, what would we expect from making a declaration of a major incident? You go on to give the definition of a major incident under the Civil Contingencies Act, is that right? Mm -hmm. And over the page... You say declaration of a major incident in Wales would lead to the establishment of the Emergency Committee Wales and the establishment of four strategic coordinating groups across Wales. Um, you explain that at the time of writing, all uh, LRFs have started to form 
uh, SCGs. And Public Health Wales has attended or will attend all meetings arranged during the week commencing the 9th of March. Um, <clears throat> and then you set out, don't you, the benefits of declaring a major incident in response to COVID-19 and explain that a recurring theme of lessons identified in multi-agency debriefs is that major incidents are not declared soon enough. Timely early declaration would apply previous lessons. Two, you say... that. In, in the middle of that paragraph, the response structures that support SCG decision-making would be made available. <coughs> Examples include tactical coordinating group, multi-agency media cell, the mass fatalities coordinating group, logistical prepa preparedness group, and recovery coordinating group. All these supporting structures and groups can benefit the response to COVID-19. Formal decision logs of actions would be kept. That's paragraph three. And four... SCGs would be able to make multi-agency decisions and use partnership networks on key areas such as communications and mutual aid in a more effective manner than existing arrangements. Specific areas could include, and then you give some examples such as domiciliary, domiciliary care and care of the vulnerable, closures of specific schools and events, consistent and effective use of PPE across agencies, and managing public anxiety, addressing any panic buying over the page, ensuring multi-agency consistency of communication messaging on health, welfare, prevention and delay of the spread of COVID-19. And at the bottom of this section, set against this, there are the costs and consequences of setting up the above support infrastructure, which will require resource capacity and may deflect or impact on the undertaking of necessary actions it is assumed that the necessity to declare a major incident overrides these considerations. And then in conclusion, you say Wales is confronted by a pandemic. The known characteristics of COVID-19 and the known characteristics of the population of Wales suggest that the impact in Wales could be significant. Considerable preparatory work has occurred in Wales in the containment phase, but as we approach the delay phase, this will need to be expanded and accelerated. So, does that document set out why Public Health Wales thought that the government should be treating this as a civil emergency? Yeah, I mean, we wrote this paper. Uh, it, it might be just helpful to just make a couple of points just to um, locate this in the narrative here. So. The WHO declared a pandemic on the 11th of March. Following our first case uh, on the 27th, announced on the 28th of February, we began to see case numbers rise. Um, and by this week uh, of the 11th of March, those uh, case numbers were rising uh, exponentially. Um, what I didn't know... I don't think any of us knew, in fact, I'm pretty sure none of us knew at that time, is that COBRA had discussed the legislative basis for the response by then, I think on the 2nd of March, and had decided against using civil contingencies legislation in favour of public health legislation. That quickly became apparent to us in the coming days as we saw the coronavirus bill being developed. But at this stage... And in response to what we had been uh, told by Welsh Government in the email we referred to earlier, I, I just felt we need to put our, lay our cards on the table and say to Welsh Government, this is how we see it. Are you going to use emergency legislation? And was this your way of trying to persuade the Welsh Government to take its own course? Yes. Is it right that the feedback that you received from the Welsh Government was that such a declaration would not be helpful? Um, that was given to me verbally via Dr Tracy, who had, uh, I think, received uh, communication from Welsh Government. Thank you. Um, can I ask you, please, about the uh, development of local plans? Mm -hmm. Is it right that um, Public Health Wales has asked to produce some guidance in relation to those, and those were received on the 21st of August 2020? We sort of asked ourselves, I mean, what I was looking at during the summer was uh, at the state of preparedness of the health boards for uh, what we could expect in the autumn and, and the winter. Um, and I 
personally felt there was a mixed level of preparedness. Uh, so I put it to the chief medical officer, we probably ought to ask the health boards uh, for these prevention and response plans, uh, and we'll write the guidance for you, which is what we did. So in your view, they were not, they were not all satisfactory? They were not all satisfactory. Some There were a couple who were actually doing a very good job, but there were uh, a few that were causing us concern. And is it right that the Welsh Government had said that they would write to the health boards in relation to those plans? Um, and then you were surprised to read a letter from the Government, which is at INQ 00014725. Yep, so this is about seven weeks later. So the Welsh Government wrote out, asked for the plans. We received the plans in mid-August. Uh, at the Health Protection Advisory Group on the 24th of August, uh, my deputy uh, um, presented, uh, my, I and my deputy had reviewed those plans. He presented our findings uh, to that HPAG meeting. Uh, it was quite clear that further work was required. Uh, by all of the health boards, uh, some much more than others. Uh, and so I was surprised then, you know, three weeks, four weeks later, uh, that apparently the Welsh Government seemed to have stepped away from that plan, uh, and the and we use can see of that. plans. I'm sorry. Apologies. Uh, and we can see that in, in the second paragraph where they say that events have moved on rapidly since then. We had anticipated providing further feedback However, it has not been possible to finalise that. And then it goes on to say, as such, we will not be providing formal feedback on your plans. We're sorry for any convenience this may have caused. What's the importance of having satisfactory local plans in the response to a pandemic such as this? Uh, right, well, I'm not quite sure where I begin to answer that one, to be honest. I, uh, We've only got a few minutes left. OK. Well, I think I'd already set the context in, in the summer. We were looking ahead to uh, almost certainly a second wave in the autumn winter. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, to give uh, some acknowledgement to Welsh Government, we were by then in the thick of it with um, uh, all these local uh, protection um, uh, arrangements being put in place around Wales. But nevertheless, we were looking ahead uh, and I was just concerned that um, our health boards, uh, public health functions were not necessarily geared up for what might come in the winter. In your statement, you say that what you think was missing in the first few weeks, from the 8th of January until the 20th of February, was national strategic leadership and coordination from Welsh Government. Do you stand by that? I do stand by that. And are there any other reflections that you would like to tell us about? I don't think so. Is there anything else that you think Public Health Wales could have done better or earlier? Um, I'm sure we could have uh, done quite a few things better and earlier. Uh, and uh, I set out some of my reflections in my statement, as do other, uh, uh, as has Dr Cooper. I don't think I have anything to add to what I've already said. In your statement, you specifically mentioned the challenges that you faced in mobilising and expanding staff. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. And uh, I was interested in the discussion, or rather the questions you were putting to Dr Cooper yesterday about that. Um, we are now in a much stronger position than we were. But I think this is more than just simply about resourcing public health Wales. Grateful as we are to Welsh Government for the additional investment, uh, this is also about a system-wide preparedness for the future. Um, I allude to that in Para 157 with some reflection. Uh, I still think there's more work to do to ensure that Wales and its uh, system of public health system uh, is ready for a future pandemic. Thank you, Dr Sandifer. My lady, those are all my questions. Thank you very much. I think... Um Ms. Fubisher, you've got some questions, and then Mr Gardner. Thank you, my lady. <clears throat> Good morning, Dr Sandifer. I represent John's campaign in Care Rights UK. I'm going to refer to your witness statement, if it's possible to bring that up. Um, that's INQ 000 267 And I'm going to look at page 12, paragraph 50. And 
you say in the bullet point in paragraph 50 that you chaired a gold meeting on the 13th of March 2020 to discuss stopping routine community testing, closing down contact tracing in a managed way so as not to leave vulnerable people exposed. Can I ask, what did you mean by a managed way? So those people who were already, if you like, in the system that had been made known to us and we were conducting uh, contact uh, tracing, um, we needed to make sure we concluded that process uh, for those individuals. As this is the containment to delay and our response to the UK government's decision to move from containment to delay and what that practically would mean, um, essentially in response to the letter that the CM or the link letter the CMO had produced uh, on that. And what factors were considered in relation to how this might impact vulnerable people? Um, so what um, we recognised is that uh, as we moved to hospital uh, test um, uh, hospital testing, um, that we uh, would therefore be stepping away from our community testing process and that we would therefore need to engage with the community through a broader range uh, of activities through our professional communications, through the local health boards and their directors of public health. Um, and, of course, we never withdrew contact tracing entirely because in response to any local outbreaks or incidents, uh, we would have uh, responded to those uh, as we would in any other public health, uh, at any other public, uh, time in a public health way. <coughs> I'm going to refer next to your paragraph 117, which is on page 28 of your witness statement. Um, this kind of goes over towards the bottom. Um, I'm going to get, look at page, the next page in paragraph 118 as well. Um, so in 117, you refer to a Public Health Wales advice note dated the 24th of October 2020, of which you were a contributory author, um, which was to inform Welsh Government decisions about steps to be taken after the fire break. And then over the page, looking at para 118, you explain about halfway through this paragraph um, that the note acknowledged the harms from restrictions, including on personal mental health and access to health care. So if we can turn to the advice note itself, which is INQ 000 147260. And I'm going to to look primarily at page three, but it might be helpful to just look at the beginning of the section, which is at the bottom of page two, if it's possible to get the kind of split between those pages up. And essentially, this, this note is talking about um, recommendations for post-fire break. And what's said at the bottom of page um, two is that while some regulation may still be required, this should only be used where, and then there's three bullet points. Um, and looking at the, the final bullet point, this says, the harms arising from regulatory impacts on access to health care, mental health, unemployment, and consequent ill health and mortality have been calculated, and the population health benefits of the regulations have been shown to exceed the harms caused on a disability-adjusted life years basis. So do you agree that this note recommends that further restrictions should only be imposed if those calculations have taken place? Uh, yes, I mean, it's just worth, I think, saying at this point, um, a range of people were involved in the drafting of this, uh, including uh, Professor Mark Bellis, uh, whom, uh, whose name was mentioned by Dr Cooper yesterday. And at that stage, we had established our population health group within Public Health Wales, which was uh, examining the wider uh, impacts uh, of COVID uh, on uh, the population. Um, and uh, this uh, was, um, as I recall it, uh, a suggestion uh, from the work of that group uh, that we should um, clarify uh, uh, our expectations around this. 
And was there ever a thorough calculation of the harms caused by restrictions I don't on those know. needing care? Uh, to be honest, I don't know, but that might have uh, been undertaken by the population uh, health group, but I don't know for certain. And if we wanted to find out, who would you recommend asking? Uh, I guess we could get that information from within Public Health Wales, so I'm happy to take that away as an action from this inquiry, if you wish. Thank you. Thank you, my lady. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Yeah, Dr. Sandler, if I ask questions on, um, on behalf of the Children's Commissioner for Wales. Uh, you briefly uh, discussed uh, your actions and the actions of Public Health Wales in the post-lockdown uh, post-first lockdown period. I just have two quick questions relating to those and to school closures and reopenings in particular. So, uh, firstly, can I ask, ahead of schools reopening on the 29th of June 2020, uh, what if, uh, advice, if any, uh, was requested and given by Public Health Wales? Uh, I'm not sure. I wasn't uh, closely involved in uh, the work that uh, any work that Public Health Wales might have been doing in that area, uh, so I don't know. It's sorry. Okay, I'm grateful. Uh, the second one, perhaps, is uh, follows on from questions just being asked in relation to the fire break. Uh, in the statement, in your statement, just ahead of that, at paragraph one one six, I don't need you to turn to it, but you, you note that Public Health Wales did give advice on the fire break. Uh, for the benefit of the inquiry, that that advice is dated the twelfth of October twenty twenty and is INQ. 00014-7258. Um, in that advice, uh, it appears that, that it is recommended that a number of actions are taken, uh, but it doesn't appear that it is recommended that schools are closed, just universities. Uh, do you remember that advice? Uh, I rem remember that advice. And uh, can I ask, uh, as schools were closed on the 23rd of October 2020 for those year eight and above, uh, would you suggest that uh, th that action was taken in line with Public Health Wales's advice? Uh, I don't know if we provided specific advice uh, on uh, school closures in respect of this advisory note. Um, I note that that was the date of the start of the school half term, uh, and I think that was a consideration that TAC or TAG had, uh, had given um, in advance of introducing uh, the fire break. I'm not sure if uh, Public Health Wales uh, was asked or indeed gave any particular advice on that specific point. I see. So it was simply just a... It, it wasn't an omission or a deliberate address. It was not simply... Not at all. The, the issue of the universities had been brought to our attention specifically with regards to... Uh, we had a lot of students obviously had arrived in Cardiff, many of them uh, perhaps as... as freshers, um, and looking uh, through uh, the course of that term, um, what would be the position that we would recommend uh, with regards to the universities? Uh, and that was uh, prompted us to put in the advice as set out in that advisory note. I'm grateful, my lady. Thank you, Mr Gardner. I think that completes the questions for you, Dr Sandover. Thank you again for your assistance. Uh, and I do understand the long and very demanding hours that people like you um, spent trying to serve the public and responding to the pandemic. And please, rest assured, I shall very much bear the context in mind when I come to produce reports. But in the meantime, thank you again for all that you and your colleagues did. Thank you very much, my lady. Yes, Ms. Kerr. My lady, may I please call Shavana Taj? Sincerely and truly. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but, and the, nothing truth. but the truth. I hope we haven't kept you waiting, Mr. Charge. 
Ms Taj, could you please state your full name? Uh, Shivana Taj. Thank you for assisting the inquiry, both in terms of providing your witness statement and for your attendance here today. Can I please remind you to keep your voice up and to speak slowly and clearly so our stenographer is able to take a record of your evidence? Your witness statement prepared for this module may be found at INQ 00027363. We can see that that statement is signed on the 8th of September of 2023. Is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Thank you. Ms Taj, you are the General Secretary of the Wales Trades Union Congress. You explain in your witness statement that the Trades Union Congress brings together 5.5 million working people that make up its 45, sorry, its 48 member unions drawn from all parts of the UK. You go on to note that the Wales TUC is part of the TUC and that it represents 400,000 workers in Wales through its affiliated unions. The Wales TUC has devolved responsibility within the TUC for matters which are within the powers of the Welsh Government and the Senate, matters that are wholly specific to Wales, and developing policy on matters which impact substantially differently on Wales than elsewhere in the UK. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. In your witness statement, you provide a detailed summary of the general role of the Wales TUC, and the inquiry will have regard to the matters that you there set out. But is the role of the Wales TUC perhaps best captured in your own words from your statement, where you state that the purpose of the Wales TUC is to improve the economic and social conditions of workers in Wales. Correct. Thank you. You explain in your witness statement that throughout the pandemic, the Wales TUC had frequent communications and liaison with the Welsh Government. You explain in your statement that the context for that communication was the approach in Wales to social partnership. Can I please ask you to explain what's meant by the term social partnership? So social partnership um, is uh, what we often refer to as the Welsh way of working. Um, it's a long-standing uh, tradition in terms of how the Welsh Government has always um, operated. Uh, the pandemic uh, meant that a Shadow Social Partnership Council was then set up. Um, and that meant that um, trade union representatives, uh, the Wales TUC, leading um, on behalf of, of our affiliates with them there with us as well, um, employer organisations and the government were able to be in the same space together. But the pandemic allowed us the opportunity then to expand that tripartite model and bring in others, including uh, many of the commissioners too. Thank you. You speak very quickly, Ms. <laughs> George. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. It's failing. I, I have to. Sorry. So. Sorry, right. I apologise. Can slow down. It's don't a Cardiff worry. thing. I'll try and... Please don't, <laughs> don't worry. Um, you may have touched on this already, but can I just ask you to explain how the approach to social partnership that you have just set out affected the Wales TUC's engagement with the Welsh Government during the pandemic? Yeah, so... Um, in some instances, it's, it's probably useful for me to uh, reference some of the, the things that we were able to, uh, to do that led to directly to decisions which improved conditions uh, for workers during the pandemic. Examples of this uh, can be uh, specifically in relation to some of the tightening up of regulations, um, workplace regulations in early 2021, the improvement of the administration of the Welsh Government's isolation support payments um, and other financial supports as well. And uh, particularly um, important was the issues around uh, communications uh, with workers on PPE provision and also workplace guidance as well. In Wales, the some of the differences here specifically was that uh, the Welsh Government made sure that in their COVID guidance yeah. that it was made clear that employers should be consulting with their trade unions when it came to um, workplace risk assessments. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask you some questions about the engagement that the Wales TUC had with the Welsh Government during the pandemic. I'm going to ask you to outline the specific mechanisms that were in place to facilitate communication between the Wales TUC and the Welsh Government. If I may begin with the Workforce Partnership Council. Yep. In your witness statement, you cite the Workforce Partnership Council as a forum for social partnership. You describe the Workforce Partnership Council as a tripartite social partnership structure that included the trade unions, employers and the Welsh Government. Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. 
And you also explain in your witness statement that the remit of the Workforce Partnership Council was to cover the devolved public services in Wales. Yes. Do you think membership of the Workforce Partnership Council facilitated the Wales TUC's engagement with the Welsh Government during the pandemic? And if so, can you say how, please? Yes, um, absolutely. So um, in terms of the uh, Workforce Partnership Council, there are um, also a, uh, a number of different groups that sit beneath it. Um, so we have a, a health sector forum. Uh, we, have, uh, we then establish a social care forum uh, as well, because again, as the pandemic progressed, we knew that there were big issues um, in that um, area. There's an education forum, but there were some gaps. So some of the gaps that existed, particularly um, as things progressed, were in relation to hospitality and retail. Um, and some of the unions um, that organise uh, workers in those areas, um, including uh, unions such as Equity, which represents a lot of the creative sector union, um, workers, were, we made sure that they equally had a voice and a direct channel into uh, the Welsh Government. And so the sort of sectoral engagement um, ended up expanding um, and led to some you know, good decisions being taken. So, for example, um, the, in, one of the differences here in Wales was the creative sector unions were then able to um, access a special fund that was set up specifically for them. And um, individuals, uh, workers sometimes, who could kind of fall between the cracks, for example, uh, people such as taxi drivers, we were able to ensure that they also had a voice when decisions were being taken around hospitality. So, yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Before I go any further, and I'm sorry to come back to this, I am going to have to ask you to just slow down a little bit. I know it's very difficult, but if you can please just try okay. and um, do your best in that regard. Thank you. I'm now going to ask you about the Shadow Social Partnership Council. Mm -hmm. In your witness statement, you describe that the first iteration of this council was established in 2019 and that this council served to bring together Welsh ministers, employers and trade union representatives. The inquiry understands that membership of the Shadow Social Partnership Council was extended during the pandemic and the first minister convened fortnightly meetings of the Shadow Social Partnership Council. Is that correct? That's correct. In your statement, you say that meetings of the SSPC typically took the form of an update from the First Minister regarding the COVID-19 situation. And then there would be two further updates, which were usually from other ministers or the Chief Medical Officer regarding the Welsh Government's response to the pandemic. You state that the Council would typically meet after Cabinet had taken decisions, and this provided an opportunity to advise on how decisions would be implemented. If it's right that the Shadow Social Partnership Council would typically meet after Cabinet had taken decisions, does that mean that the work of that council didn't actually influence decisions or become involved in decisions? Um, the, the opportunity that we had was, whilst those Cabinet meetings had already been taken, um, the, the, those meetings had taken place, the discussions that we would be having through the Shadow Social Partnership Council um, would take place before any public announcements were being made. And so there was an opportunity then for us to be able to influence uh, some of the messaging, for example, or also to point out where there might be some gaps, particularly um, around uh, some of the COVID guidance, some of the, the changes that might be coming up, and the need to make sure that um, every worker was able to access um, that guidance in a way that was understandable uh, for that particular sector or for that particular worker. Yes, thank you. I'm now going to ask you about the regular briefings that the Wales TUC provided to the Welsh Government. You explain in your witness statement that early in the pandemic, an arrangement was agreed for the TUC to provide regular briefing documents summarising for the Welsh Government the key and current issues being raised by the range of unions. The inquiry will have regard to the examples of issues raised by the Wales TUC in these regular briefings, which you've set out at paragraph 31 of your witness statement. Mm -hmm. But can I ask you, do you consider that these briefings were an effective means to communicate the issues that were being raised by your members to the Welsh Government? Um, I would say yes. Um, so some of the things that we did do um, through some of those arrangements was um, in real time 
uh, raise uh, matters that were being brought to our attention. So, from our perspective, you know, we uh, we were very clear as the Wales TUC that not our responsibility wasn't just to people who were members of a union, but was to also make sure that all workers, regardless of whether or not they were in a union or not, were being protected. And so um, we, for example, set up a very quickly a COVID um, helpline through our website. Uh, people who weren't necessarily um, either directly impacted uh, could, uh, could feed in. We had examples of where um, one um, man contacted us um, in relation to his wife. Um, who was a mental health nurse. Um, and she was in a situation working in a ward where PPE hadn't been provided because the assumption was that everything were, it, it wasn't necessary at that stage. There wasn't enough understanding. Um, we were able, um, and she ended up in an altercation with a, uh, a patient um, who ended up having COVID. He was, she had messaged her husband. Her husband then went onto our website, fed the sin, and we were able to pass on that information in real time to uh, the minister uh, through, uh, through the um, Welsh Government advisers and through some of the Welsh Government staff. And quite quickly, uh, that matter was then dealt with. And the union rep was then also um, contacted on site as well. Yes, thank you. I'm now going to ask about the liaison that the, Welsh TUC, the Wales TUC sorry, had with the Welsh Government in the early period of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you set out in your witness statement that the first significant liaison the Wales TUC had with the Welsh Government was on the 12th of March of 2020, when the Minister for Health and Social Care and the Minister for Housing and Local Government held a conference call with the Wales TUC. In your view, did this engagement take place sufficiently early? Um, I think it uh, took place as quickly as it could do. Um, at that stage. Of course, you know, when you look back, you think, D was, was Wales actually prepared? Um, could things have been different? I think, yes, absolutely, things could have been different. But I think some of the difficulties perhaps are around the fact that the Welsh Government, uh, you know, don't have, uh, even now, a direct responsibility for employment rights. Um, they don't have direct responsibility for enforcement. Could we, so, could we avoid any trespassing into what might be thought to be constitutional political matters, please, Mr. Tarsh? Okay. I have a number of terms yes. of reference, but they don't go that far. I, I, I think, um, Ms. Tarsh, it may be fair to say, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the question was, did this engagement take place sufficiently early? And I think you said that it perhaps took place as soon as it could have done, yeah. but it could always have been earlier, yes. should other things have been in place. Yeah. Um, can I ask document, can I ask please that we bring up document, oh, I'm so sorry, I can see that it's been anticipated. Um, here we have a letter that was sent by you to the First Minister on the 14th of March of 2020. In this letter, we can see the immediate priorities for the Wales TUC <coughs> in relation to the government's response to the pandemic at this stage. At page one, and going into page two of the letter, you set out four key concerns um, that the Wales TUC had at that point. Those concerns were namely the procurement of PPE, the dissemination of workplace safety guidance, the adequacy of sick pay, and support for those who are suffering hardship. Yeah. To what extent do you think that the Welsh Government took the concerns you raise in this letter into consideration at this point in the pandemic? I think that they um, listened to us. Um, we felt that we did have to keep pressing on some of these issues, particularly in relation to PPE. Um, we, uh, I think there's a, a statement as well that we have um, submitted in our evidence uh, alongside, it was a public statement that we made uh, with the BMA. We'll uh, come to that shortly, yes. Um, but it, it sort of... Um, is intertwined with that as well, which yes. gives you the a clear understanding that it, we felt that we, we had to keep pushing on some of these issues at the beginning. Thank you. Just in the interest of completeness, um, the document that we have brought up is INQ 00006458. Thank you. I'm now going to um, ask some questions in relation to the Wales TUC's concerns regarding PPE. But at the outset, I, I wish to be clear that 
PPE will be considered as part of later modules of this inquiry. So it's not necessary to give a detailed account of any arrangements um, at this stage. You do note in your witness statement at paragraph 65 that on the 31st of March of 2020, the Workforce Partnership Council Health Trade Unions issued a statement. And I'm actually going to ask that this be brought up. That is INQ 00006872. At page one of this document, underneath the heading PPE, we can see that the concerns raised were as follows. PPE failing to reach frontline workers, the clarity of the Welsh Government's frequently asked questions in relation to PPE, a lack of detail around what the amount of PPE purchased actually means, a gap in provision for those who are not able to access PPE under current guidance, but who cannot practice social distancing due to the nature of their roles, and PPE provision in private social care settings. In your view, were the concerns you raised at this stage of the pandemic in relation to PPE adequately addressed by the Welsh Government? Um, this eventually um, led to the setting up of uh, two different groups. Initially, uh, there was one in relation to PPE, um, trying to um, get a clearer understanding of where PPE was being distributed, um, who was actually able to access that. Um, some of the gaps that still remained really was around uh, PPE fitting of PPE. Um, that then moved on to uh, testing as well. Um, so that became a big issue for us. But I do think as a result of us continuing to raise these issues and these matters being brought to the attention of ministers directly, it did mean that uh, social care workers in particular who had raised concerns, those in private care homes and uh, those who worked in third sector led uh, care homes were then eventually able to um, get the, the necessary PPE that they needed at the time. Thank you. And I think this is the statement which you've referred to um, just now, but at paragraph 68 of your witness statement, you refer to a joint statement on PPE in health and social care yeah. that was issued by the Wales TUC and the BMA Cymru on the 12th of April 2020. Could we please bring this document up? It's INQ 00018091619, please. At page two of this document, at the third paragraph, the joint statement states, while we have maintained regular dialogue with the Welsh Government over PPE provision in health and social care settings, we need far more detailed information to fully understand their plan to ensure that workers' health and safety is being adequately considered and to provide our members with the reassurance they deserve as they continue to serve the public. And then the statement goes on to set out the particular areas about which information was sought. You call for the Welsh Government to be transparent and to give an honest response on stock levels of PPE, where um, the stock is, um, where it's being stored and when they will be delivered. You also call for independent inspectorates to check on supplies. In your view, to what extent did the Welsh Government have regard to the concerns expressed in the statement? I think that they were, um, were genuinely concerned, um, which is why, um, again, going back to the Shadow Social Partnership Council and the various different sectoral um, arrangements that exist where unions can continue to um, uh, make the case um, and, and through the, the, the channels of communications that we had then eventually uh, when the National Health and Safety Forum was set up, there was the um, opportunity to, to make improvements. And um, I think that the, the Welsh Government um, did um, do the right thing. Um, eventually, we were able to have more information. Uh, some of the lacks, uh, some of the areas where we did um, still struggle with, particularly was around uh, fit testing. Um, some of those conversations uh, were better in particular sectors. In others, they were um, not so much. Um, but the uh, some of the big stories that we were, the reason why um, it's referenced here around appropriate changing facilities, for example. One of the reasons why um, that was there was because as uh, health unions uh, continued to hear um, at this stage uh, from workers in, in those settings that they weren't quite sure 
uh, whether or not they could take uh, their uniforms home to wash, for example. Uh, we had um, a, a case where somebody had contacted our helpline and said, I have just finished my shift, I've taken my uniform off, I'm currently standing in the car park, I've put it in a carrier bag and put it in the boot, I'm now going to go home, I'm not sure if I can wash this at home, and if I do, what temperature should I be washing it at? So that's just an example yes. of some of the things were happening and why it was so important that we opened this uh, detailed dialogue with the Welsh Government. Yes, thank you. You explain in your witness statement that the advice given and representations made to the Welsh Government was predominantly based upon the feedback and information provided um, by the Wales TUC's affiliated unions and its members. And the inquiry will have regard to what you set out in your witness statement regarding the proportion of Welsh employees that are either members of a union or have union representation in their workplace. I'd now like to focus on two specific examples of work carried out by the Wales TUC in relation to evidence gathered about the experience of workers in Wales. And the two specific examples I would like to focus on are the experience of black, Asian and ethnic minority workers and the experience of disabled workers. You explain in your witness statement that from the outset of the pandemic, unions were reporting that black, Asian and minority ethnic workers were being discriminated against in a number of ways. For example, not getting access to adequate PPE. In your witness statement, you refer to the BME COVID-19 advisory group, which we have heard about already in this um, module from Professor Emmanuel Ogbonna. You state that you attended the majority of meetings of the BAME COVID-19 advisory group and that you assisted Professor Ogbonna in the drafting of the advisory group's report. From the perspective of the Wales TUC, how effective do you think the meetings of the advisory group were? Um, I think they were definitely um, effective because one of the things um, that then happened was there was a subgroup that was set up specifically to look at uh, the development of uh, individual risk assessments. They were initially uh, developed um, in, uh, with um, healthcare workers in mind, uh, but they were expanded upon. Um, and um, we... Um, we're also in a position, because we were looking at the disproportionate impact of COVID-19, um, again, referring back to uh, some of the information that we were picking up from affiliates um, at the time. So, for example, there had been um, an outbreak um, in two food processing plants. There was a significant number of migrant workers um, English was not their first language, Welsh was not their first language, and so they really struggled with COVID guidance. And had it not been for uh, the unions um, in that space at the time, um, we would not have been able to, uh, one, find out what exactly had happened, whether or not risk assessments had been conducted, um, but also some of the information, the intel that we picked up that then assisted uh, uh, this group, but also the Welsh Government more broadly, um, was the fact that some of these uh, migrant workers were, um, you know, living in shared accommodation. So they would go to work together and then they were living in accommodation where, you know, transmission um, became uh, quite difficult to manage. We, um, the reason why um, I think as well it was important and, and for the Welsh Government to look at the socioeconomic factors was because at that time we were, as from a Wales to UC perspective, any information that we were gathering, we always made sure that we took a, a public position, that our information was readily available to anybody. Um, you know, when you have somebody who looks like me in this position, there are going to be a number of people uh, from those uh, minoritized groups who will directly contact me and ask questions. And we were then able to point them in the direction of uh, various different uh, uh, unions that could um, support them as well. And as you say, you've referenced the fact that we'd put out a call for evidence um, as yes. well, particularly for BAME workers that thank we fed in. Yes, thank you. In your witness statement, you also explain that the Wales TUC Equalities Committee invited the Deputy Minister and Chief Whip, Jane Hutt, to two of its meetings, one on the 21st of April of 2020 and one on the 5th of May. Can we please turn to the minutes of the first of those meetings, the meeting of the 21st of April? That's INQ 00006864.
So the context um, of this meeting is that prior to this meeting, a paper produced by the Wales TUC Equality Committee regarding the equality impact of COVID-19 had been circulated. We don't need to bring that document up yet. But looking at these meetings, at page two of the minutes, at paragraph 10, the minutes record that the Deputy Minister and Chief Whip suggested that an assessment should be made in the near future of how points from that meeting have been taken forward, and she agreed that regular meetings would be useful during this crisis period. As far as you are aware, was such an assessment, as is intimated in those minutes, ever made? Um, well, uh, in addition to the, the COVID-19 advisory group and the report into the disproportionate impact of COVID-19, um, what did happen was that uh, Wales then developed a series of um, equality action plans. Um, and there's uh, lots of work that has gone on um, into that. Um, particularly in relation to race, in terms of uh, disability and LGBT plus matters as well. So some of the, the issues that we were raising in these meetings, we have then seen action being taken. I think it's important for, for me to also uh, sort of say, as far as uh, the minister, Jane Hutt herself is concerned, she was, you know, she really was a consistent advocate um, on equality issues. And she, she genuinely uh, worked hard to make sure that any information that she was gathering, uh, particularly through her engagement with the unions and the Wales TUC, that she was feeding that back up at a cabinet level, but also making sure that all departments understood our role. Because, and I can say that because on a regular basis, we would hear from an official yes. who would say, Jane has suggested that we talk to you on the following matters. Thank you. Can we please bring up the report to which I earlier referred um, that was discussed in this meeting? Um, that's a report prepared by the WTC Equality Committee. It's INQ 00006-8460. If I can ask, please, um, page six, going into page seven, to be brought up. There we will find 10 issues that it's reported disabled people and carers were facing. These issues included how frightening DNRs, um, do not resuscitate notices, had become for disabled people, that people with motor neuron disease had not been identified as being extremely vulnerable and were therefore excluded from automatic admission onto the shielding list. There were examples cited of shielding letters being sent to the wrong address, disabled people struggling to um, receive reasonable adjustments or maintaining their reasonable adjustments due to workplaces being understaffed. As far as you are aware, were these concerns acted upon by the Welsh Government? I think that the, uh, as far as the, the shielding letters are concerned, there was some confusion um, at the start um, of the uh, pandemic. Um, and we raised these matters at the Shadow Social Partnership Council meetings, um, and in some cases, the um, sectoral meetings as well. Employers, in Wales and I think in parts of maybe some of the, the Welsh Government officials didn't necessarily um, understand the, the detail around the, the, the furlough scheme, for example, um, and uh, the fact that people um, could request to be furloughed uh, by their employer, even if they were classed at that point um, as a key worker. But of course, it was always the case that reasonable adjustments could have been made, should have been made, and that's why the impact assessments and the individual risk assessments uh, were important. But we, we continue to in engage um, on this issue. And when it came to disabled workers, um, of course, uh, there were a number of jobs, like before the pandemic, we always heard from employers who just assumed, well, you know, we can't make reasonable adjustments because such as somebody being able to work from home, yet, Actually, as things progressed, lots of workers, including disabled workers, were able to, uh, you know, conduct their duties from home, um, and that was something that we really pushed for. Okay. Can I just interrupt here? I think the question was, um, did the Welsh Government act on it? I appreciate you've spoken about a number of meetings and engagements and representations you made, but was any action taken? I think that there was there was some action taken. I, I couldn't on every single point that we've um, identified here. I would probably need to go through that and uh, provide you some with some further information uh, after, if that's okay. Yes, thank you. You explain in your witness statement that a particular value of social partnership in the context of the pandemic 
was that the Wales TUC was well informed as to how, in practice, the various approaches adopted to um, MPIs were being implemented across a range of sectors. I'd like to briefly look at three specific MPIs. Firstly, self-isolation and sick pay. Secondly, lockdowns and local restrictions. And thirdly, working from home. In relation to self-isolation and sick pay, you're clear in your witness statement that the dominant feature of Wales TUC's concern was the extent to which workers um, were, asked, were able to self-isolate without significant financial hardship accruing. Can we please turn to document INQ 00018098489489 please. please. This is a letter sent by you on behalf of the Wales TUC to Julie Morgan, Deputy Minister for Health and Social Services. In the third paragraph of page one and the second sentence of that, you state that the fact that many social care staff who are typically low paid continue to face a financial penalty for taking sickness absence is contributing to the spread of the virus, particularly within care homes. And we would, recommend, we would welcome a similar policy commitment in Wales that extends to all social care workers, including agency workers. Did you feel that this concern was addressed by Ms Morgan and the Welsh Government? So, um, it, the, on the, um, when we vote to, uh, first of all, of course, the GMB um, raised this issue. And when the GMB raised this issue, it is important for me to also flag that uh, the individual who wrote that letter had been a care worker for over a decade before she became uh, an officer representing that workforce. So they were matters that were really uh, close to her. Um, she had understood them uh, uh, very clearly. Um, and so when they wrote to uh, Julie Morgan calling for social care workers to receive sick pay, um, and then we uh, later uh, referred, uh, referenced the disincentive to comply with infection control measures um, and the fact that um, the, uh, there had been, we requested that the consequential from the infection control fund was introduced uh, to, uh, to fund a sick pay scheme for social care workers. As of late of October, we still, still didn't have clarity actually uh, what the, as to what the delay was. Um, and so I think that the, um, for, for both that scheme, um, but also in relation to the, the wider, um, the sick pay um, enhancement scheme for social care workers, but also the wider uh, self-isolation support scheme, we uh, repeatedly requested data um, on, on, the, on its uptake and um, we, w uh, we failed to get anything robust specifically in relation to the uptake of the social care sick pay scheme. And we are not quite sure um, why it, it took some time for that to be introduced. It could well be that there was a funding issue and there were decisions that the government needed to take at the time. Thank you. If I can now ask you briefly about local restrictions in Wales, and I wish to focus on the circuit breaker that was um, implemented in Wales in October of 2020. Now, you're very clear in your witness statement that the Wales TUC supported the decision to implement a circuit breaker, as it was, in your words, the right call for public health. However, you go on to note that the difficulty is that whilst Wales elected the Welsh Government to make decisions over public health, it was the UK Government that was responsible for wage support. Yeah. Now, from the TUC's perspective, how problematic was this aspect of devolution regarding the implementation of the firebreak lockdown in October 2020. Be well, careful here, please. I can't go into the devolution settlement, so if you can answer that question without trespassing too far, Mr Tarsh, please do. But it is a very tricky one. If, well, from... I just wonder if I might ask the question in a okay. different way. Perhaps okay. if I could ask... Um, from the Welsh T Wales TUC's perspective, how did funding affect the firebreak lockdown in October 2020? The fact that we were going to be going into a firebreak and workers uh, who, you know, particular sectors were set to be shut down, particularly hospitality and retail, for example, that had um, just about reopened. Um, and people, uh, some of the uh, music venues had started to reopen. If the fact that they were going to be shut down and there was going to be no financial support, how could we um, ensure that people would comply uh, with the regulations? And so 
the, you know, it felt as if the, the UK government uh, didn't seem to care that it was putting Welsh government in an impossible situation, forcing them to decide. I think you're now... I think... Saying. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, if I now may briefly ask you about working from home and specifically um, the development of regulations requiring working from home in December of 2021. You state in your statement that on 17th of December of 2021, the Welsh Government published changes to its work from home regulations, whereby workers in Wales could face fines of up to £60 for leaving a place where they are living for the purposes of work where it's reasonably practicable for the person to work from home. The inquiry will have regard to the statement that the Wales TUC issued on the 21st of December of 2021, where you set out um, your concern that the worker is not responsible for the place of work. That is the responsibility of the employer. You also explain in your witness statement that on the 22nd of December of 2021, the First Minister clarified that the focus of um, any enforcement activity in relation to the regulations pertaining to working from home would be on employers permitting and enabling home working. Do you feel that the Welsh Government had therefore taken your views into consideration on this issue in the development of this um, regulation? This was... Um this was quite a difficult one uh, for, from our perspective. Um, on the 20th of December uh, 2021, we'd, had, you know, we'd seen the news reports that the Welsh Government um, had introduced a working from home regulation. Our concern was that the focus was back on the individual worker rather than the employer. I think that it felt uh, we were quite clear that maybe there was a misunderstanding about the uh, worker-employer relationship and where the power actually lies. Um, if an employer was um, asking an employee to come into work knowing fully well um, that uh, they could be ending up facing a fine and that worker then wasn't doing as they were told um, and that work worker then was being threatened with potentially not having any more hours, for example, because the assumption would be that, you know, not everyone is on a permanent contract. There are lots of people in Wales, a significant number of people who are on uh, zero-hour contracts, that somehow uh, that, they would, uh, that they would be responsible. I mean, look, Mr. workers... I don't mean to interrupt you, and I apologise. I'm just mindful of the time. Can I just ask, the question was about whether you felt the Welsh Government um, acknowledged, responded to the concerns that... The Wales TUC had expressed on that point. Do you think they did? Um, I think that they um, understood where we were coming from, and they, there was a statement made uh, eventually um, by the First Minister, uh, making it quite clear that the focus here is on the employer, uh, but there was definitely some confusion. Thank you. I'm now going to turn to my final topic, which is public health communications and public confidence. You explain in your statement, and the, inqu the inquiry will have regard to this, that you consider a major concern to have been what you term an information deficit in Wales, mm -hmm. where you say that only a relatively small proportion of the population were receiving news about the country. And you state that the news and information deficit was an important factor during the pandemic. You state that the information deficit added to public confusion, especially when rules were different in Wales to those in England. You explain in your witness statement that the Welsh Government lacked pre-existing channels with which to communicate their key messages with workers, and this meant that often there was insufficient relevant focus on how key communications supported people in dealing with workplace risks. Could I just ask, what channels do you think ought to have been in place? So there were the, the daily um, sort of press updates that, that were given, um, but there, when it came to information, more often than not, the information that people were receiving, they, you know, they were, on one hand, uh, watching Welsh news to see what the First Minister was saying, and then on the other hand, they were watching to see what the Prime Minister at the time, Boris Johnson, was saying, so there was definitely some confusion. Um, a lot of the, the media that people receive isn't necessarily Welsh media. Um, and so national media would reference uh, UK regulations, um, wouldn't necessarily uh, differentiate uh, with what was uh, needed uh, to be understood here in Wales. So I think that the, that kind of news deficit definitely added to the confusion when you know, English and uh, Welsh rules ended up diverging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Taj. Milady, that concludes my questions.
Thank you very much, Ms. Cohn. Thank you very much, Ms. Target. I'm sorry I had to stop you from trespassing. I'm sure you're a very strong advocate for your cause, but um, please be assured you're not the first person I've had to stop from trespassing into matters that are beyond my remit. But thank you for your help. Thank you. Right, quarter to two. All rise.